Are we alone? Are we alone? Probably not. Odds are probably not, because there's a lot of potential biological experiments out there. Okay, so a lot of potential for it. Uh, but you say you're probably not because you think that the possibility of the origin of life is a relatively easy, or there's so many things, even if it's relatively hard, there's so many possibilities that, that gets, that the difficulty of forming life gets over uh, compensated for by the numerous, the, the, new, the large number of Earth-like planets. Is that what's going on? Yeah, pretty much. Because the existential question, are we alone, essentially means, uh, you know, are we unique as sentient beings in the universe? And if there's a void or 10 billion Earth-like habitable worlds and billions of years for interesting things to happen in each galaxy in the universe, then those numbers are pretty compelling. That you know, it would have to be an extraordinarily unique experiment if we were the only outcome on any of those worlds. So you think that the probability of the emergence and persistence of life is larger than one divided by the large number that you just cited? Right, and the, I guess the big arguments now in, these, in this field, now that we know there's a lot of habitable biological real estate, is uh, you know, what happens on those worlds. You know, we could imagine large fraction of them being dead, uh, another significant fraction of them only having microbes. And, and, and maybe most of them only having microbes. But saying we're alone is such an extreme statement in the face of those numbers that that's why I say we'd probably not be alone. So if we found some planets with the microbes on it, we, would we consider ourselves to be alone still? Like I most think, people might. Yeah, I think for the, certainly for the general public, the are we alone question relates to the sense of being alone or having companionship. So I think the word itself tells you that we're talking about sentience and intelligence and communication. Some people live in Manhattan and they feel alone. Yeah, but that they have the potential. That's their to, fault, right? <laughs> there's a there's a lot of sub uh, sub uh, you know subconscious communication even among people who think they're alone. They're vying for body real estate on a subway, or they're making they're avoiding making eye contact, which is an act of communication itself. Uh -huh. So we're social species. The idea of being alone is kind of has a negative connotation, I guess, we're, because I think, we're social. I think so. I if mean, we were orangutans, we would say, oh, "Is there? Are we crowded? Are we crowded?" <laughs> it could be special. I mean, to be alone in the universe that's abundantly full of the possibility of life would be an extraordinary outcome and make us extremely special. I mean, sort of anti-Copernican outcome. But it depends on what you mean by alone. Like you said, if most people would consider it, you'd be alone if you found some microbes. But if we right. found some unicellular eukaryotes or some right. fungi, or we, most people would say, oh, we're still alone. We're still alone. And maybe you'd say we're still alone if the universe has created other you know, high-level organisms that are inscrutable to us, oh. where there's no possibility of yes. communication or understanding, then then we're still alone operationally. Yes. I feel alone among inscrutable people all the time. Right, and so those are just inscrutable <laughs> people that share your DNA. <laughs> if they don't even have DNA, that's going to be even more inscrutable. So in the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean? We, I just take to mean humans, humanity as a species. And of course, you could ask the question about our planet, given that we share it with at least a handful of intelligent, sentient species with whom we can't communicate, uh, so we're maybe not even alone on this planet. Right. Um, how about, how about uh, let's suppose there was somebody who had a really strict requirement for being alone, and that is, or yeah, he, had, he said, I'm, I'll be alone uh, unless I find somebody who could speak English, an alien who could speak English. Right. Now, do you think that person is alone? Do you think if that were our requirement, we would say be alone? Because you said we're probably not alone. Yeah. But if my requirement was English speaking, you'd probably say we are alone? I'm, I'd get a lot more confident that, that we're alone because the contingency of the outcome of developing intelligence and then on top of that, developing you know, some mode of communication and a linguistic capability that's identical or, or a, a variant of English is, seems banishingly small. So you think English, or a variant of English, is much, much more quirky than uh, the evolution of life? Yeah, I mean, the, that's one of the problems with the tropes of science fiction, or, or Carl Sagan contact, I mean, a really esteemed scientist. There's still a predicate of the ability to communicate. I mean, I think in the whole search for extraterrestrial life or intelligence, 
it's far more likely that you'll get evidence of some, you know, some unnatural signal that indicates some intelligence at work without being able to understand the message or communicate. The communication part is, far, is a far higher bar than the determination that the communication is an unnatural thing and couldn't have emerged randomly in the universe. Well, you, used, you made a distinction there between artificial and natural. Mm. And uh, how do you make that distinction? Well, it's just an operational distinction that the, you know, the SETI people have to worry about all the time. They have to somehow decide that a signal is not from natural astrophysical causes. Well, but there's, a, there's an ambiguity associated with this word artificial and natural. For example, is a bird's nest natural? Some people think yes, some people think no. So if, if, if I thought stars were alive and I had a noise coming from a star, I'd say, oh, that's life, that's artificial signals. And right. other people say, you're crazy. Your stars are not alive, therefore it's natural. Right. So and the, the problem, that's their fundamental problem. You have to understand the totality of all natural physical processes that can lead to you know, phenomena that you can measure or signals. But aren't brains natural? Yeah, they're natural. So then there's no artificial communication at all. But you know, brains are a byproduct of biology, so we're talking about biological and non-biological. Oh. But if we're scientists and we have naturalistic explanations for the origin of life, then that kind of get, should get blurred as well. Yeah, and it, there, another blurring point of this is that if evolution elsewhere, you know, uh, goes from biology to non-biology, you know, transcends biology and then becomes computational or machine-like or yes. some other version, then that, that's another whole realm. You would just transcend it into another realm and, and that, that could be out there too. Well, do you think we should uh, look? Uh, do you think we should look for that type of? Wait a minute. <laughs> Big bite. Uh, uh, Martin Rees, I think, and Paul Davies thinks that uh, we should go looking for artificial. We shouldn't go looking on planets for life. We should be looking. Uh, I don't know where we should expect a biological things like. Uh, I don't know, satellites and computers and yeah. silicon-based th intelligences that don't need water and a liquid, squishy planet. So I think, and I think astronomers have caught on to that too, so there's, there's renewed interest in looking for artifacts as opposed to just looking for intentional signals or trying to communicate. Um, and, and, but that's a, that's a difficult thing. They're, you know, the first wave of experiments looking for thermal you know, imprints of a civilization. They were using Dyson spheres or something like that. So mm -hmm. just look for disequilibrium in their energy use. There's so, so many contaminating signals. That's a very hard experiment to do astronomically. So people have, were sort of chastened by their first attempts to even try that. Is the question, are we alone, an important question? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, the human condition being what it is, on our uncertainty as to our place in the universe or whether we'll persist or survive, you know, it sort of matters if we're alone in this or not alone in this. But presumably if we find out, you know, some aliens, we talk to them, every time there is a revolution in our understanding, like I guess Copernican revolution or Darwinian evolution, a large fraction of the population is disenchanted with it and, and alienated. And I imagine that if we find out you know, make contact with some alien civilization, that, that that effect will be even larger, and a lot of people will not want to recognize it. And uh, much like, I guess, indigenous populations don't want to recognize science because it undermines their traditional views. And if we have, we, obviously we have lots of traditional views about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, is that a good thing? Maybe we should keep ourselves isolated as long as possible. I, I think those viewpoints are very anthropocentric because it, it's not obvious that the recognition or the awareness that we're not alone actually impacts you know our behavior or our civilization or our you know it's, it's just an existential question you want to answer they're unlikely to be able to help us with our problems or solve our problems for us well every time I mean Stephen Hawking says we should keep our head down because he's right. afraid that uh, I guess based on human history that when one technologically advanced civilization contacts another less technologically advanced that one gets beaten up and killed. Genocide is often the case. So uh, we might be on the receiving end of the genocide. You're not afraid of that? Not particularly. I mean, of all the, you know, dozens of answers to Fermi's question, you know, the, the they don't care seems a completely plausible They don't one care? Today. They don't care. I see. Well, we don't care about other species, therefore we're making them go extinct all over the earth. Right. That's not a good sign. No, but that, right. And so, but that's still an intervention on our part. 
So we don't think of it. We're just we're just doing our thing. It's yeah, hard just, to call it. We're just not conscious. We're just acting like a small child <laughs> left alone in a house full of fragile. Or things. a dominant bully uh, yeah. who's <laughs> taking over the universe in some war game or something. Right. Uh, so you're not afraid of aliens killing you? No, I think that, I mean, it's it's a fair amount of projection to be worried about that. It's sort of, sort of pretty far down the worry pile. But, but wait a minute, wait a minute. But when we do analyses of the average age of Earth-like planets in the universe, the yeah. average age is about two billion years older. Right. Two billion years is a long, long time to evolve, and presumably, I mean, in two billion years, if we don't kill ourselves by that time, we will be so unrecognizably sophisticated right. that no one would want to talk to us, you and me, who... To two billion years later. I mean, exactly. So, so that's the don't. They, for me, that's the they don't care. The timing mismatch suggests that the likelihood that but, it's but, edifying. But when the life form doesn't care about you at all and is t billions of times more powerful, that seems like a recipe for disaster. But o only if it matters to them whether we exist or not. Well, not really. For example, we. C uh, it doesn't matter to most people whether chimpanzees exist, but we're cutting down the rainforest and, the, and, right. and their habitat like crazy, and all these. Organisms are going extinct. We don't care about them, but right. because of our power, we just phew, wiped out their but habitat. But that's competition for resources. I mean, humans started messing up the planet, surprisingly to most people, when there are only a few tens of millions of us, let alone 10 billion of us. So there's a lot of good real estate out there. The universe is a big place. I just don't think competition for resources is a realistic <laughs> thing to worry okay. about. Okay, when I was, one of the reasons I do astrobiology is because I had an identity crisis as a kid. I wanted to figure out who I am, you know, what, what does it mean to be a human being? But uh, you, th and I guess maybe you shared some of that. You what, yeah. we want to know what it is. And, and uh, does it make you a better person to have such an identity crisis and to follow the goal of trying to figure out who you are, even, uh, I mean, as an astrobiologist? I think it's a useful, it's a, it's useful. a salutary thing to consider your place in the universe, consider that you might not be part of a species that's the most advanced biological organism. So that, humility is a virtue. That they, well, it can be if it changes behavior <laughs> or affects behavior. <laughs> so, so awareness of that, um, you know, potentially can change behavior or create a perspective that makes you more tolerant of other entities. So you're into astrobiology, not for the money, but for the identity. I wasn't it from the money, but I, you know, it took a decade or so to realize that 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 was a false premise there. The money was somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you, start, you were in it for the money. The yeah, and, and then I realized, right? oh, the money was all in leveraged derivatives <laughs> and you know, high, high order financial things. Okay, uh, why should anybody care about astrobiology? I mean, you and I do, but we're kind of, I'm preaching, we're preaching to the choir here. Why should some man in the street, this woman over here, why should right. she care about astrobiology? I mean, from a daily perspective, not. But if, if any, all of us are thinking creatures at some level, and it is one of the biggest unanswered questions of science that science can address. There's some unanswered questions in science that science may not be able to address in our lifetimes. And this is one where we may be able to address it in our lifetime. But, but I would guess that most people, or most men would say, a much more important question than are we alone is, does she love me? Sure. So They're uh, not mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Tell me about biosignatures. Uh, do you think that uh, life on other planets will produce biosignatures? And if so, why? I think um, the lesson of the Earth, as much as we can use the lesson of one planet, is that life is a pervasive condition, if you like, of a planet once it takes, sets in. And so on Earth for four billion, or close to four billion years, it's dramatically altered the geology as well. So the interaction between biology and geology in the atmosphere leads to biosignatures that, that we could see from afar if they were happening elsewhere. So lack of the pervasiveness of life on Mars is evidence that there isn't any life at all? Yeah, I mean, that was Love, Lovelock, obviously, in the 1970s, you know, was sort of hired. Um, he took a career turn, and he was hired by NASA um, to think about Mars. And his, his thought, of course, was, wow, if there is life on Mars, it will produce a pervasive signature. And, and then since then, we've sort of decided that Mars is sort of on the edge of is a nearly dead planet or a almost dead or a recently dead planet. Um, but for Earth, um, you know, the biosignatures are dramatic and would be for any Earth analog. And we know there's lots of Earth analogs out there. Let's talk about this question about uh, what is life. To, I mean, if we don't know what life is, uh, how are we going to find it? That's a big issue, of course. NASA's, you know, hit by that all the time because they're 
using taxpayer money and billions of dollars a mission to answer questions. So they have to be able to answer a question. And to answer the life question, they have to search for nucleic acids and life as we know it to produce an answer. Um, but if, if it's an alternative biochemistry or a non-nucleic acid-based information storage system, um, you won't find it or you won't be able to detect it and do the experiment. So that's a, that's a classic conundrum of the people doing this kind of work. But do you think it's worthwhile to have a definition of life? Um, as long as you're, it's not a doctrinaire thing. I mean, it's the, the narrower the definition is sculpted to our form of biochemistry, um, you know, the more you may be missing options. Because, I mean, it was uh, Watson, I think, right back in the 50s when computers were huge primitive things who answered a reporter's question of what is life by saying it's digital information. So it's kind of a remarkable thing for a wet biologist in the 1950s to say. So even he knew that fundamentally it was information storage. And I suspect he had the breadth of, even as he came up with the, you know, the central paradigm of biology, he recognized that that might not be the only way it well, could if you, occur. If you agree with that, then you think viruses are life forms? Well, that's, that's, that's a, that's a the bound, information. Yeah, it's a boundary condition, and maybe they are, yeah. But they, are, they have to be commensal with other creatures, so. Don't all creatures have to be commensal with other creatures? Yeah. So there, apparently there was an extremophile in a mine in South Africa that was an ecosystem of one. I, I'm not sure if that's held up, but I, I yes. read that. Yeah, I read that too. I'm, not, I'm skeptical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm skeptical. An ecosystem. Yes, that was a guy from Princeton Ott or something. Okay. So Solstack in 2012 wrote a paper that said, uh, attempts to define life do not help us to understand the origin of life. And uh, that struck me as something interestingly important because I guess because if we're scientists, we have a naturalistic transition, and the most important thing that we can find out is what happened, the, the transition and the evolution, rather than any definition. Any definition will, will be destined to be deconstructed as we get closer and closer to the, the events we're most interested in. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and I think that as an experimental field, because the origin of life is you know, an experimental science, it may be an undecidable proposition because it's historical science, and the evidence is mostly gone. There's no way we might know if there had been failed experiments that didn't, you know, we just know the one form of life that pervaded, dominated, ate all the other kinds, and, you know, became everything we know and see from microbes up to us. So, um, I think... Except up to us. Well, from all, all scale, a, all scales from single celled up to... Up to? Yeah. Or you in, used the word up. In scale, yeah. I didn't mean in, in <laughs> primacy. I've had my hand slapped by microbiologists for saying yeah, microbes, so microbes are simple. <laughs> <laughs> microbes are so simple. You know, I just, you can just do that to annoy a microbiologist. Well, they're simple morphologically, but not chemically. Right, hmm. exactly. Okay, um, let's see. Now, have you seen a UFO? No. No. You ever been abducted by aliens? Not to my knowledge. What do you but do? But they could have erased Yes, they could have. Memory. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, what do you do with people? When, how do you talk to people who, in your public lectures, come up to you and say, I was yeah. on UFO, UFO or I was abducted? Do you say politely try to get rid of them or something? or what do you... I, you know, it's, it's hard because you have to be patient. So I, I don't to blow them off because that's not helpful for public communication. Um, and, it, and in the end, of course, it doesn't help because you can't rebut or comment on their personal experience or their friend or their buddy or their relative. So I, you know, I just trot out you know, in succinct form as I can manage the you know, massive statistical evidence that the things that people think are UFOs are not, and that's been demonstrated, and that you know, I refer them to David Grinspoon's nice book where he embedded with the abductee communities in the southwest of the United States and got into their heads, basically. Yeah, I mean, really? he, did, he did a rap. Which book was this? It's um, the most recent Lonely one? Worlds or Lonely, I can't the, remember. He wrote two, and mo not the most recent one. Then. Not the most okay. recent one. And okay. First so in human hands, yeah, not that one. So there's this really cool chapter where he uh, he did the rapporteur thing, and he really he, he tried to understand where this came from, uh -huh. sociologically and culturally, and he did. And it's 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 not, and it's a uh -huh. completely in the spectrum and akin to the things we see in the political discourse. You know, these little hermetic bubbles of self-sustaining misinformation conspiracy theories, etc. And he identified it and understood it and was sympathetic to it at some level. <laughs> He's sympathetic with everything. <laughs> because these are, you know, these are the, the abductees, especially. He's a musician. He can be sympathetic That's with everybody. That's true. 
So the abductees in particular, he noted, you know, they often were dealing with really difficult social, mental problems or whatever, and, and this was, there was a coping mechanism yes, involved yes. Well, in this. Well, well, so as there is in everything, right? Yeah. Um, what kind of aliens would you like to meet? Wow. If I ask your emotional side, forget your rational side for a second. Right. What kind would you like to meet? Um, I guess I would like to meet aliens that had, you know, that had discovered and invented mathematics, you know, at a level far beyond what we have and could, you know, elucidate realms of mathematics that, you know, are sort of unimaginable to us. That would be very interesting. So ones that are not so advanced that they couldn't communicate right. with you. You just want slightly more advanced ones. And slightly doesn't have to be much. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> as we know, a thousand years more advanced or a hundred thousand years You'd more advanced. You'd be happy with that. Yeah, that's totally. Because, because I don't know we'll make it that far. And so, you know, that would be very interesting to see what the road that far ahead might look like. Well, do you agree with Stephen Hawking that we should keep our head down in the sense that we should not send signals out, but we should just listen? No, I guess I said that I don't. I think the imputation of malign motives is is a projection. I don't. I don't honestly. That's looking at our experience and saying, well, we do this, so they're likely to do this, or they might do this. There's no evidence that they would or should, and I don't think they care enough or feel any competition to make them want but, us. But for the past, I don't know, 10 minutes we've been talking about intelligent aliens. Isn't that also a projection? Sure. The fact that they You exist. just demeaned the projections. Oh, that's well, not good, no. but now you've been, you're, you're fully aware. No, fully intelligent accepted. aliens is a, is a substantial, in my mind and others that I talk to, it's my probability of existence that, you know, that there are. And malign aliens not. Well, it's a, it would be a subcategory of a smaller them. probability. Not, not the dominant category. I mean, <laughs> being fearful of it implies it's the dominant or most likely outcome, and I don't believe. I don't think it would be agree. fearful so much as, uh, you know, the precautionary principle. It might be the case. So I'm not sure if we should worry about it, but let's just uh, make sure that we don't send signals out to, as right. a conservative, as a, I don't know, a conservative thing. But you could just argue that that's, uh, if you're being... Uh, in this evolutionary and advancement sense of intelligence that that's being pessimistic because it's our malign primitive basal cells that have that negative side and okay i mean as various well thank you for that so so you you say that it it uh, is assuming that everybody's a malign or something what is what was your no, it's just it's assuming assuming the malign as dominant to me takes our worst selves and projects that into our future. If we were a global Buddhist culture, we wouldn't have killed so many people, but we might not have had space travel and we might not have had astronomy and we've even found out about exoplanets. So, you know, there's, there's a two sides to that. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with a caveat, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Oh, I would do some huge scale um, nanobot solar sail. Nanobot solar sail? Nanobots attached. I mean, it's some uh, amped up version of what Breakthrough Starshot are going to do, is, but do actual, do, do the physical exploration, do remote sensing. I mean, two prongs, do the remote sensing. I mean, follow the route that we're doing with big telescopes and Earth like planets, but also do some, uh, you know, some direct exploration by small probes. So when you say uh, uh, imaging, do you, would you do coronagraph, coronography, or would you do a space-based interferometry? If you're gonna look, try to look at these, I guess the infrared spectroscopy to identify molecules in, uh, in uh, Earth-like planets elsewhere, what type of technology would you invest in? I mean, y yes to all of the above. You, want, you need to be in space, you need the highest resolution, so you need interferometry in space, and you need extremely high contrast so all of those appetizing you know uh, techniques would have to come into play so you wouldn't invest in microscopes to find nano aliens in your bathroom um no that's uh it's a it wouldn't need that kind of money for a start <laughs> so that would be a little side project <laughs> okay well in the in the movie men in black there's an interesting uh well, it, it turns out we are like inside the we're inside of an alien or something. Right. So, what do you, th you think we're an inside of an alien? Well, that 
that's dangerously close to the, the galaxy is alive mm -hmm. school of thought. So no, I don't. Oh, and that's a bad idea that a galaxy is alive. No, it's just. A rather, it's a dangerously close. Rather, so it must be some danger well, associated with that idea. Dangerously in that it's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you think? Wait a minute. You think the idea that the galaxy is alive is a bad idea? I'm being uh, colloquial with the word bad. I mean, uh, it, it's an intellectually weak idea. Okay, why? Tell me. Which I what, would call bad. Okay, why? So based on what's the evidence against that idea? Because I think without being overly reductionist, I think we know what galaxies are. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, not, it, there's no missing, there's no uncertainty that would leave space for them to be alive in a biological sense. But we don't know what life is very well. Yeah, but we know, we know it when we see it. <laughs> we do. And, when, and when we, we see a do, huh? and when we see a galaxy, we see a galaxy. We see a bunch of stars, okay. gas, and dark matter. Oh, we'll argue about that later. Yeah. Arthur C. Clarke said, "Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic." And then there's this guy Carl Schroeder says, "No, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature." The idea being, if you're sufficiently advanced, you're more of a tree-hugging, sustainable ecologist rather than a chainsaw-wielding parking mm -hmm. lot builder. What do you think of those? Um, I, I probably agree with Arthur C. Clarke in the sense that, I mean, and it aligns with the, what I was saying, that they don't care. So I think the, at the conjunct of intelligent entities out there, more intelligent, more advanced than us, are either invisible, inscrutable, uh, you know, uncaring of us and therefore not likely to interact with us or intervene or destroy us. Um, I think those are the most likely options. Undetectable is another one. Invisible, undetectable, all of those things are so quite the, possible. So the one that you, when I asked you what would you like most to detect wasn't, you said uh, aliens that are capable of talking to me and teaching me like a thousand year advanced mathematics that wasn't in the list that you just said was no problem. because I think no the thing that I would most like would indeed be communication I mean the goal yeah. of not being alone is to be able to communicate right, but you didn't include that in your list of the most probable ones that you just said. no because I think most probable is a disconnect that's so extreme that communication is not on the table a disc so why do you want to do it well I, th that doesn't mean that's unique it doesn't mean <laughs> that's the only form of life Okay. I mean, there you, you you. It's what uh, Seth says about SETI all the time. You know, you, you know, you you do the SETI you can do at any given time, and you therefore are sensible or um, able to detect the civilizations that are the most analogous to you. So but you're not as. Uh, I mean, Seth, Seth has often made this case that oh, since we have an exponential increase in our sensitivity and coverage and frequency and instrumentation, that we are bound to find something in the next de decade or two. And do you agree with that? I'm not totally because having that the the reach of SETI to hundreds of millions of potential sites for radio telescopes and pulse lasers in the galaxy doesn't affect the probability which you don't know that any any advanced life form uses those technologies. He's assuming that they do, and they're, he's assuming, they're assuming that they're out there, and then his state, yeah, he's statement just, is correct under that assumption. Right. I see. Now, a lot of astrobiologists. There's a debate in astrobiology about what features of life on Earth are convergent or not. The idea mm -hmm. being that if we can find multiple independent examples of something evolving on Earth, then those features would be the best candidates for what we should expect elsewhere. Uh, what do you think of that argument? I, you know, and the biologists argue about that. I, it, I mean, it's true up to a point. The convergent evolution obviously exist. There are examples from the biochemical and small scale to the morphological and eyes and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but they're still sculpted by the same overall environment and so once you you know go into a different set of physical and chemical environments elsewhere then you don't know that the convergence will lead to that place or even that convergence will operate. These other environments may be more stochastic or uh, you know, more variable than our environment. There's, a, there's a, an analogously big argument amongst biologists about whether it's better to have, you know, mostly stability or mostly instability and chaos as a, to further evolution. To, to undermine that argument even further, I would suggest that most cases of independent convergence have, have a deep homology, that they, for example, mm -hmm. the independent eyes are not independent, they have the same right. basic biochemistry. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And, and then, so the contingent arguments are, are pretty strong too, but we just don't have a, you know, scientific basis for 
deciding between those when we're just staring at our navels in one biological experiment. So, you, so what about this idea that if we replayed the tape of life that uh, Stephen Jay Gould has talked about, mm -hmm. whether we should or should not expect anything like us to reappear? Yeah, I mean, it's an undecidable proposition. I mean, he took a particular perspective on that. Um, I think that's an area where we can make progress because obviously what we should do, and you know, if you had the $100 billion, the other thing you would do is truly scour the solar system, the little habitable spots in the solar system uh, extensively, you know, the dozen or so moons of outer planets, most of which are not well known to, to the average person that have, you know, water, all the ingredients for life, water, energy, carbon material, and just find out if there's biology anywhere in the solar system. Just do that search really well, and you would learn a lot by whatever you found. I, th I think it was Carl Sagan who said that we are the way for the universe to be aware of itself. That's, uh, what do you think of that statement? That's as close as Carl would have got to religion, I think. And uh -huh. I, don't, I don't subscribe to it. Necessary. I mean, I, I, you know, he, he's lyrical, evocative, poetic, so I don't always think he's speaking in scientific modes, and I don't think that was a time when he was. In the movie Contact, I guess you've seen that, mm -hmm. at the end, several times, uh, three times during the movie, they say, hey, are we alone? And uh, particularly at the end, Jodie Foster's character gets asked uh, by a little kid, are we alone? And she says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Right. What do you think of that comment? That was, um, uh, that's attributed to, I should know, it's a couple hundred years ago. So the, the English guy, 1820, I can't remember. Anyway, that's an old quote. Um, Carlyle, Thomas mm -hmm. Carlyle. Yes. Yeah. So, um, n no, that's a, again, that's a waste of space is a, you know, is a heavily packed phrase. Yes, yes it is. So I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, that's like, that's getting anthropocentric at the level of, you know, why is the universe so large and, oh, it's because cosmic parameters were X, Y, and Z, and so should or shouldn't we be surprised by that? So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the space itself is something that you would attach a word waste to or not. Hmm. Okay, and um, you've given public lectures to students, so what do you think their biggest misconceptions are about this question, are we alone? I think, well, they're big, almost all their misconceptions are formed by having lived in the amniotic fluid of the science fiction culture and in <laughs> movies, especially in film and TV, that most of them don't read science fiction. Their water so, hasn't broken as much. So it's, it's, it's Star Wars, you know. I mean, that's by the numbers, it's, it's the Star Wars ethos, it's the, the, which is the Star Trek ethos and so on. It's the, the, unsurprising expectation that we live in a, some big galactic community in just a matter of time before we run into these. Well, Bracewell has, you know, he talked about the Galactic Club as a, as a yeah. scientific idea. He was a scientist. He wasn't a Hollywood movie maker. Right. And he believed that it's pretty much the same thing as represented by this Galactic Club of right. things that are going to help us as soon as they find out we exist or as soon as we, you know, so overcome some threshold of civilization, they'll sign our form and let us into the Galactic Club. Right, and I trip over that for the same reason earlier that I tripped over some of these other premises, that I think the, the predicate of communication and understanding is, is such a high bar to clear that, I, that, that you have to you know, set aside all of that stuff because the likelihood is inscrutability. Okay, so any science fiction movie which represents uh, aliens in an inscrutable way you think is unrealistic? Yeah, on, on average. Not that they don't exist at all in all mm -hmm. the, because again, the real estate's big, the number of biological experiments is big, but, the, but that if they're rare, then the operationally, in terms of being isolated in time and space, yeah, we're so operationally you, alone. So you like Stanislav Lem's uh, Solaris then? Yeah, I like that, of course. That's are there any other inscrutable aliens? I guess the, in 2001, there's, uh, aliens are kind of inscrutable. Right? Yeah, that's, a, that's about right, too. In well, Contact, too, those aliens are inscrutable. Oh, actually, wait a minute. They, did, they came in the form of Jodie Foster's father, who then... Right. Okay, so... And, and then just the whole idea that we could unpack the information and, you know, help ourselves, you know. It's, it's some, and, and that, again, is very close to biblical. It's a sort of... They're either salvation or damnation. You know, it's either the Hawking or the Sagan vision of aliens, mm -hmm. which is to me essentially a metaphor for religion, a modern scientific metaphor. Well, do you, 
Well, occasionally I accuse SETI scientists of looking for God because they say, what, I say, what are you looking for? Oh, we're looking for some advanced omniscient civilization, consciousness that can, I can talk to and it will help me solve all my problems. And I said, you're looking for God. What do you think of that accusation? Yeah, it's fair enough. Holds water. <laughs> but you I, I haven't not, accused you're, them. You're innocent. You haven't accused them yourself because you're more diplomatic. I haven't accused them. Yeah, maybe I'm more diplomatic. But, but I, yeah, that's a thought I would have, yes. <laughs> But you don't throw it. You don't throw it in their face. Huh? No, because they're scientists, on, and because I think their projects are cool. You know, I still support their projects. Yeah. So. Okay. I still support their projects too, but I, I still throw it in their face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any advice for students who want to become astrobiologists? Well, it's a great field. It's it's still growing. You know, science is having trouble with funding, and you know, the, it's it's not a vastly growing enterprise. It's under stress. But astrobiology is very interdisciplinary. It does attach to big foundational questions, and so you know, if you're willing to take some chances with a career, because carving out the path is not as obvious. It's as if you want to be a solid state physicist. Here's what you do, and here's where you study, and here's where you go. Mm -hmm. So I I still think it's a it's a good thing. And are we alone? Um, no. And you say that because? I just say that because the, the 10 to the 18 Earth-like worlds and 10 or 11 billion years of potential biological evolution means that to have none of them sentient, intelligent, technological, and communicable would seem unlikely. And your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox then? We're isolated. We're isolated. We're isolated in time and space. And a conjunct of that and the inscrutability, like the likelihood of inscrutability. Okay, so all of the close ones are inscrutable, and uh, the ones that we would be more able to understand, the scrutable ones are farther away. And or inscrutable and or invisible or, or, hard, or undetectable, hard to detect.